everyone. Today we're going to be doing something that we all love. Math. Math seems to be one of those things that you either love or hate or love to hate. But no matter how you feel about it, math is still an important skill and doubly so in programming. Today we're going to brush up on our math skills and then I'm going to show you how to start using math in your programs. Don't worry, I promise it'll be easy as pie. Aww. Oh, and there's going to be a lot of math puns. Don't make that face. Not all math puns are bad. Only some. Okay, we should probably get started. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start by doing a quick little review on some basic math terms and symbols, and I'm sure you're going to recognize most of these. So first we have our basic calculation symbols, right? Got our plus sign, minus, multiplication, and divide. Now, this is a backslash. That's how computers divide. You might also know it as the division symbol from math. Now, along with these symbols, each of them also have specific terms, right, that indicate the symbol. So, do any of these ring a bell? For plus, we've got sum. Minus is going to be difference. Okay. Multiplication, we have product. And when we divide, we end up with a quotient. And I am so impressed I just spelled that. All right, yes, so now, these terms tell us how a specific result was calculated. If I tell you that 10 is the product of five and two, that would insinuate to you that I multiply those together to get 10. So, do you guys know uh, what the minus sign said to the plus sign? Are you sure I make a difference? And the plus sign said, oh, I'm positive. Okay, I, couldn't, I can't help myself, guys, it's a condition. So, next we've got our grouping symbols. Within these, we're going to have a pair of parentheses. And the reason that I say pair is because whenever you have an opening parenthesis, you always have to have a closing parenthesis. Okay, so those always come as part of a set. Our grouping symbols are used to group parts of our formula so that they can be executed in a certain order. And we'll get back to that in just a little bit. Now, finally, are the less commonly used relational operators. This is going to be less than and greater than. And the reason that they're called relational operators is because we use them to define the relationship between the value on one side and the value on the other. By saying it is either less than or greater than, we can show the difference between them and how that relationship is. So these can be kind of easy to get mixed up. So I've got a little trick for you. Let's do it together. Hold your hands out in front of you with your palms in towards you. Now show a count of two on both hands. Rotate your left arm hand down, elbow up, and this creates a less than symbol. Left for less than. Kind of like when we had to learn which way was left as kids, right? Now do the same with your right arm and you get greater than. Pretty cool, huh? Now let's do a little practice. First of all, do you see anything weird about this formula? For humans, we do it like this. We put our equal sign on this side, and that's because when people do math, the assignment direction for the calculation goes from left to right. So this happens, and then the value gets assigned right here. Computers, on the other hand, they solve from right to left. So their assignment direction is the complete opposite of ours. That's why when we initialize variables, we put the equal sign with the variable over here because this is gonna execute first and then the result of that calculation gets put into the variable on the left. Now, this syntax is very important. If we tried to execute this as code, it, it wouldn't work for us. Now, if we executed this as humans, I'm sure that you know what the sum would be, right? It's going to be 7. And the plus sign here indicates that to us, that we need to combine these numbers to give us our final result of 7. So the symbols in a formula tell us a lot about how those variables or those values should interact, but are all symbols created equal? In case you didn't know, the equal sign is actually the humblest of all the symbols because it isn't greater than or less than any other symbol. 
All right, now let's take a look at this formula. What do you think the result of this calculation would be? Let's work it out. So two times four is gonna give us eight, right? And then we take eight plus 10, this gives us 18. Divide that by two, leaves us with nine. Is that right? Nope, wrong. The answer is actually 13. So while calculating this formula, we forgot one critical math rule, PEMDAS. And that might ring a bell for some of you. Do you remember what it stands for? PEMDAS is the order of operations for mathematical calculations. So it tells us in what order we need to address each symbol as we calculate a formula. So let's go through this just for a reminder. So P stands for parentheses. And then we have E for exponents, which is usually written kind of like a superscript up here. If you see it in text, sometimes it'll be something like this. Okay, so exponents. M is for multiplication. D for division, our backslash or our division symbol. And then addition and subtraction. All right, perfect. So with an understanding of PEMDAS, Let's see if we can recalculate this formula and get the correct answer. So, do we have any parentheses? Nope, no exponents, okay. Multiplication, right here. So we know this is gonna happen first. So now we have eight. Any division? Yes, we do. All right, this leaves us with five, okay. So now we have eight and five, and we've only got one symbol left, our addition, which works out nicely. So if we add these together, what do we get? 13. Boom. All right. Heck yeah, we did it. So by following PEMDAS, we got a whole different result. So now this one formula has given us two separate results. As developers, PEMDAS is a rule that we need to be mindful of when we're working with math and programming, but it's also a tool that we can use to control how our formulas are calculated. I wonder if we could use PEMDAS to get yet another result from the same formula. Let's try. Now what if I told you that I wanted to get the result 18 out of this formula, but without changing any of the values or any of the symbols? How would we do that using PEMDAS? Ah, we probably put in some parentheses, right? So since PEMDAS states that anything within a parentheses pair is gonna be the first to be calculated, that means that we can use them to control the order in which this formula executes. So to get the result of 18, where do you think that we should put the parentheses? Maybe a good place to start would be around our addition here. Since that's the lowest on the totem PEMDAS poll, maybe uh, you know we'll get like big impact by doing it there. So let's calculate this out now. We know this is gonna be first. So four plus 10 gives us 14. Multiplication is next. We'll just like drop our two down here and multiply these, okay, 28. And now we're just gonna reverse it by bringing our two down with our division, which takes us back to 14. So we were pretty close, but not quite. Let's try again over here. So previously we had put our parentheses around addition. What else could we try here? What might be a, like a better position? Maybe let's try this and do this whole formula, this whole side of it within our parentheses. Okay, so now within our parentheses, we still have to apply PEMDAS on kind of a local level right here. So this is gonna happen first. So 10 divided by two, okay, gives us five. And then we need to bring our four down. Okay, and we are left here with nine. And then finally, let's not forget our two here coming down, okay? And voila, we got 18. So just by using parentheses, we got different results from this exact formula. So don't be afraid to use them, guys. They're free, go crazy. Like put them wherever you need to. Now, how about we practice this? and bring it into Visual Studio. I'll see you in a second. All right, here we are in Visual Studio. I've created a new project, I've added my source file, and I've set up the structure of my program, including all the libraries we'll need. 
If you're going to follow along, go ahead and pause the video now and resume when you're all set up. Let's build out our formula from the PINDAS example. I'm going to create a new double variable called result. Now, we could initialize this through hard coding. But generally speaking, we want to avoid hard coding as much as possible. So instead, let's go ahead and create variables to represent the different values in our formula. So that's going to be a 2, a 4, and a 10. So we're going to need three variables, one for each of those. Since all of those values are whole numbers, let's go ahead and make them ints. All right, so now we've got all the pieces that we need to build our formula. Remember that our assignment direction in programming is right to left. So whatever is on the right side of the variable gets calculated, and then that gets initialized to whatever is on the left side of the variable. So if we want to assign our variable result a value, it gets calculated on the right-hand side. So we're going to start with result equals and then here's where we'll put our calculation. Let's start with the basic formula without any parentheses. Now, in programming, when you code a formula, we're going to type it out exactly as it looks, except we're going to use our variable names to represent the numbers. Now, sometimes I see my students get choked up here, and that's totally understandable because it's kind of trippy to look at a math formula that doesn't actually have any numbers in it. But remember, it does have numbers. They're just being represented by the variables that are storing them. The benefit to writing it this way is that I could go up here and change the values of any of these numbers and not have to go through and update this formula everywhere I was using it. Now we know from earlier that the result of this calculation should be 13, right? Let's practice some modular testing habits and run this to check that it's working as intended before we continue. To do that, let's go ahead and add a little C out statement here and run this baby. Woohoo! Perfect, so there we go, 13. This is a good time to highlight that we just did something new. We just used test data for the first time. If we had run this program without knowing what we expected the result to be, how would we be able to tell if it was working correctly? Test data is critical for testing your program. If you don't know what you're expecting to see when things are working, how would you ever be able to tell that it wasn't? It's important to build up that test data trust. Now we have one more piece of test data, which was the result of 18. So let's try to recreate that here too. Now previously, we did it by adding parentheses to our formula, so let's do the same thing here. All right, now we can run this to confirm. All right, excellent, and as expected, there it is, 18. There you see, that wasn't so bad. I know puns can make people feel a little numb. Hopefully mine didn't make you feel number. Sorry, I cannot help myself, guys. It's a condition. Seriously, though. I hope that this was not only a good refresher on mathematical symbols and PIMDOS, but also illustrated for you the importance of test data and the power of parentheses. This puts you in control of the math instead of the other way around. To learn more about building your own formulas and more advanced math techniques, stick around and check out the next video. Thanks for watching, everyone, and remember, no one can do your ideas like you. Go make it happen.